Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We move into a new section of the book of Acts tonight, looking at a very interesting, very important passage, a passage in which we find a very rare word in the New Testament. In fact, as far as I can find, it occurs only twice, once in this passage here and once in the book of Romans. The message tonight entitled, The First to be Called Christians. The First to be Called Christians. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the rich privilege of studying your word. And Father, as we look at this group of believers at Antioch and why they were called Christians and why they happened to be the very first ones to be called Christians. The church had been going on for a very long period of time at this point, And yet here we find at last someone is called a Christian. Father, we pray for your blessings, that it would be not merely an intellectual study tonight, but that we might learn what it takes to be called Christians. That we might learn what the principles are, what the things are that should show in our lives, and how often those things should show. What should be our doctrine? What should be our practice? So that others who know us will say, that is a Christian man. That is a Christian woman. Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word tonight, that it would go forth with power, with clarity, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now last week we finished up a four-week series on systematic exposition and witness. We saw that was precisely what Peter was doing as he defended himself before the council at Jerusalem before the leaders who had heard a bad report. They said, um, Peter, people are talking about you that you did something that was a no-no for a Jew to do. You went in and ate, which probably means you ate some unclean things, contrary to the dietary laws, and you did it with uncircumcised Gentiles. <clears throat> Two big issues that we talked about in the New Testament, but issues which are foundational for understanding many of the basic principles of the New Testament. They are used multiple times, more times is circumcision spoken of in the New Testament than in the Old Testament, and we find multiple passages in the heaviest of the doctrinal epistles that deal with food and with eating. And as we look at those, we discover that it's not merely a question of those two things, but it is a foundation that is used for an illustration that teaches a principle that expands to every area of the Christian life. So in defending what he had done, Peter rested his defense, you recall, on obedient faith. <clears throat> God had told him to do it. He was opposed to it personally, but because he understood the vision, he obeyed in principle the important substance that needed to be understood, which was God was opening the door to the Gentiles. That obedient faith is described by Paul in Romans 14, 22. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth that powerful principle that we talked about, which is everything we do must be an act of faith. It applies to all areas of the Christian life. The second principle that we studied, illustrated by Peter's defense, was that we are to build up the body of Christ in love, not insisting on our personal rights. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, as touching things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Head knowledge results in pride. Love builds up the church by yielding rights. The third principle that we discussed was why we should not harm weaker brothers. 1 Corinthians 8, 7, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. 
But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. A principle that I'm afraid many of us fail to follow, and yet absolutely important, and one of the things that Peter is trying to avoid doing by the way in which he answers the charges that are brought against him. The fourth principle that we saw stemming out of this passage in Acts chapter 11 was make sure that whatever you do brings glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Not just part of it, but everything. The fifth principle was avoid causing offense to unbelievers as well as to the believers in anything that you do. Keep from causing unbelievers to stumble. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Your testimony is on the line. And so if you want to lead others to Christ, you don't do things that cause them to stumble in their walk toward the gospel. The sixth principle that we saw was maintain a clear conscience in yourself, not a seared conscience. Because the apostates sear their conscience. They keep running over their conscience. They keep deciding they're going to do what they want to do regardless of what their conscience tells them. Searing, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And the final principle that we saw was make sure that you clear your conscience when you have violated it rather than hardening your heart. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And we saw in conclusion that there were three conclusions that were reached because of Peter's systematic exposition and because of his obedient faith. The first conclusion was that there was peace and unity in the church. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. The second conclusion was God was glorified. And the third conclusion was the church accepted the grace of God, and true grace always results in holiness, not in lasciviousness and not in legalism. So tonight we move into verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came, and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And here's our phrase. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Amazing. All this time has gone by. Here we are near the end of Acts chapter 11. And up to this point, no one has been called a Christian. Acts 2, which was the day of Pentecost, powerful moving of the Holy Spirit, nobody is called a Christian. We find Acts 4 and 5 and Peter and John doing healings and being dragged before the Sanhedrin, but nobody is called Christian. We find many are added to the church, 5,000 more people being added to the church. Nobody is called a Christian. We find the Ethiopian eunuch being saved. He's not called a Christian. We move to Acts chapter 10 and we see Cornelius in his household being saved and nobody's called a Christian. 
The Samaritans were not called Christians. I jumped over them. And at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, nobody called a Christian. We find Acts chapter 10. We find that great vision of the sheet let down from heaven. We find Gentiles being brought into the body of Christ. An unthinkable thing for the Jews. Nobody's called a Christian. But we find at last some people who had trusted Christ on Cyprus and Cyrene traveled to Antioch. And then when the disciples at Jerusalem heard about what was going on in Antioch, they sent Barnabas. And Barnabas, when he sees what wonderful excitement is going on there, he goes and gets Paul and brings him to Antioch. And they're there for a whole year teaching. And suddenly we find a group of people who are the very first ones who are ever called Christians. What was it? What elements do we see in this text that might help us to understand what it really means to be called a Christian? Now, the Lord willing, in a few moments, we're going to see that that word called is a rare word in the New Testament. Very specialized word. The English word called shows up many, many times, more than a hundred times. But this particular word in Greek shows up only twice. First, let's look at a couple of things that are important to understanding the text. Acts 11.19 picks up where Luke broke into his narrative at the end of Acts chapter 7 and the beginning of Acts chapter 8. And everything else in Acts chapter 8 and all of Acts chapter 9 and all of Acts chapter 10 and all the way up through verse 25 of Acts or through verse 18, excuse me, of Acts chapter 11 is sort of a parenthesis. Now we are going back and picking up the narrative of what happened at the end of Acts chapter 7. You remember how Stephen finished his sermon in Acts 7 and the results of that. He finishes with a rather powerful close. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. This is Acts 7.51. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, in other words, the prophets that prophesied Christ got killed for doing it. Of whom, that is speaking of Christ, ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. And imagine who did this. It's you guys who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Now they prided themselves in keeping the law. Now it's going to be right around this point that you see our narrative is going to pick up again. Because now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. So here's what's going to happen to Stephen and a persecution that follows it. They cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Saul is going to be the man who shows up in verse 26 here in Acts chapter 11. Saul is going to be the man that Barnabas goes to bring to Antioch. And they stone Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Now, that's the persecution that's mentioned in Acts eleven nineteen. They which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Who was it that started the persecution? It was Saul. Who is it that God is now going to take to Antioch to teach them what it means 
to be called a Christian. It's Saul. We have historical narrative being put in in between that event and what happens here in chapter 11 because the book of Acts, as we've told you before, is a transition book and we're seeing God bringing in all the different groups in. But God has a very specific plan because it's not merely related to all those people back then. It's a plan that relates to us and what it means for us to be called Christians. These are people who paid with their blood even before they were called Christians. But now, the man who raised the persecution is going to be the man that brings them to a point whereby others recognize them, not merely as a sect of the Jews, not merely as something that is called a heresy by the Pharisees, but they're going to get a name a name that identifies them and has, from that moment forward through history, identified all true believers. Oh, false believers have taken the name too, but there are some things about this name that distinguish who is a real Christian and who is not a real Christian. But you'll have to wait for that for just a moment. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Those are the words that open verse 19 of chapter 11. They which were scattered abroad. Something's going on here. The obedience of the church to carry the gospel of Christ to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, that obedience was fueled by persecution. Let me pause and ask a question. What is it going to take for us to learn to obey. They were given a very specific commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They were not to simply stay at Jerusalem but go to Judea and to Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The obedience of the church was fueled by persecution. The second thing that we learn is that God was really patient with their delay. By the time the persecution arises, there were probably between 8,000 and 12,000 believers still parked in Jerusalem. We saw the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. We see 5,000 more coming when Peter preaches a minimum of 8,000. And there were those additional because it says, and the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. But what did they do? They sat in Jerusalem. They had been given a command. Now God always guarantees that we will obey his commands one way or the other. When he calls you to do something, if you don't obey it, if you're hesitant, God is very long-suffering, very patient with his people. But there comes a time when God will begin to move among them in a way that is not pleasant. And that's what happened to the church at Jerusalem. Acts 8-11, through 11, as we said, gave us the parenthesis showing the entrance of those other major groups into the body of Christ, the Jewish men first, the Samaritan men and women, the Ethiopian eunuch, Gentile by birth, Jewish by faith, uh, but neither male nor female. And then finally a Gentile family, men, women, and children from the oppressor nation in Acts 10 and 11. But 
In our text tonight, we learn five things about what persecution does. Five beneficial things about persecution. Number one, persecution causes an increase in the spread of the gospel rather than extinguishing it. You know, there have been many pogroms throughout history of different ethnic groups and actually the elimination and annihilation of some of those groups. They no longer exist today. But as you look at the history of the church and as you look at the history of Israel, whom God has promised a future, you discover that the persecution has not extinguished either group. Instead, it has caused a scattering and an expansion and a growth. The first beneficial thing that we discover about persecution is it increases the spread of the gospel rather than extinguishing it. The second thing that we discover here as we look at this persecution that had taken place and then the things that happened in those intermediate chapters as the gospel began to spread, it produces a separation of the real Christians from the phony Christians. You know, persecution tends to do that. When people have to put their money on the line, they uh, tend to weed out very quickly. When people have to put their homes and other resources on the line, they weed out very quickly. When people have to make a sacrifice of some kind, they weed out quickly. The phonies won't do it. If they have to lay their lives on the line, the phonies are the first for the door. I don't know if this story is true. I heard it a number of years ago. But at one point, it is told that the communist Chinese broke into a, a meeting of believers. They lined them up against the wall. And they said, those of you who are not Christians can leave. The rest of you will be shot. A few people left. After they had left and the guards looked outside and saw that they were gone, they came back in, took off their hats, laid down their guns and said, we're Christians too. We just didn't want any spies in the midst. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. But you know, the phonies head for the door when real suffering comes. The third thing we learn about persecution is that it produces a zeal and a quickening of the spiritual life of the real Christians. They which were scattered abroad upon the, the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word. There was a zeal here. Persecution produces a zeal, a quickening of the spiritual life of those who really are Christians. The fourth thing we learn is that persecution also produces, and we see it in our passage, an open testimony, a bold witness in those who really are saved. You know, when we have mild persecution, the kind of stuff we have here in the United States, what it tends to do is inoculate us against the real way we're supposed to be living as Christians. It's just enough to make us cower. It's just enough to make us cringe a little bit. It's just enough to make us keep quiet because we don't really want to suffer. But when you have no options except for suffering, suddenly your tongue is unloosed. Very interesting the way God has made men and the way men in their sin refuse to acknowledge him. Satan knows our breaking points. He studies us. His demonic forces study us. The word demon comes from an ancient Semitic root, da, which means to know. They collect information. They're organized. They do what they can to make you fall. 
They learn about you. So they find your weak spots and your strong spots, and then they push on the weak spots. And they usually do it in a concerted effort to make you start to fall and then come two, three, four, five with more punches. They pushed a little too far here. The persecution arose. The Christians were scattered like God told them to do in the first place. And suddenly we have a bursting forth of the gospel. The fifth thing that we see from persecution is that it results in obedience to the commands that God has given us. We may have avoided some of those commands when they weren't really convenient, but now we see that there is an obedience to the commands that God had given. They started witnessing to more Gentiles. That leads us to the second set of corollary principles that we see here in this text, is obedience results in blessing. We know that in our heads. We know that in our heads. But how does it get down into our lives? Obedience results in blessing. They started to see some spiritual fruit. Some of them that were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Gentiles, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Obedience results in blessing. It was a blessing where they began to see some spiritual fruit and not just a paltry little one or two squiggly little things on the tree. They saw a huge abundant harvest. That's exciting. Oh, that we might all learn to obey. What does it take to make us obey? There are different things that God has given each of us to do. Obedience is when we do the things that God has called us to do, not merely do other things that we want to do. And obedience results in blessing. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a one or two, and we're quite sure about them, believed sort of. Is that what it says? <laughs> No, it says, a great number believed and turned to the Lord. They didn't just believe in their hearts. It says they turned to the Lord. That's what repentance is all about. Repentance is a turning away from the direction you were going, making 180 degrees and beginning to go the other direction. It was a changed life. Their faith affected what they did. They turned to the Lord. That means they turned away from idols. They turned away from sin. They turned away from self and flesh. And they turned to Christ. Genuine faith always results, and you've heard me say it, in a changed life. Genuine faith always results in a changed life. Here we find obedient believers who are finally forced to do what they were told to do, they begin to do it, and they see the hand of God at work. And they see genuine fruit. They see people not only mouthing the words after 85 verses of just as I am, but they see people whose lives are radically changed. Oh, that we might learn to obey and see those kinds of results. The second corollary principle is that obedience that results in blessing always leads to interaction and fellowship between Christ-centered churches. Look at verses 22 and 23. The, these, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. We find interaction, we find fellowship, we find exhortation, we find encouragement, we find strengthening of the church, we find two churches that have one mind and begin to have the same purposes in glorifying Christ. 
When you see an obedience that results in blessing, you're going to find an interaction and fellowship between churches of like mind. The third corollary that we learn from this is that obedience that results in blessing always leads to a numerical growth that is produced God's way. There are churches that grow, but they don't grow God's way. This is growth that is not brought about by carnal manipulation. This is growth that we see there in Antioch that was not brought about by entertainment and the latest Christian band on the stage. It's not growth that was brought about by some charismatic type smacking people on the forehead, slaying them in the spirit, dropping them to the floor, and ushers covering with blankets so that they'd be modest. We find here growth in numbers because the people who were told to go finally went, and they spread the gospel wherever they went. Everybody they came in contact with. How many people do you come in contact with during the day? It may even be the same ones day after day if you have a routine job. How many of them do you faithfully, consistently, graciously, humbly, with discretion but clearly share the gospel of Christ? You say, well, I did it once, and then I didn't say anything else because they kind of scowled at me. Well, have you watered that with prayer? Have you prayed with fasting for that person? Have you shared Christ with them again? Have you demonstrated Christ-likeness in the things that you've done for them? Obedience that results in blessing always leads to numerical growth produced God's way, not through carnal manipulation and entertainment. Who, when he came, verse 23, and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. You see, it has to be a predetermined purpose. We sort of haphazardly go through our day and well, maybe if somebody comes across and I feel like witnessing and it seems like a good opportunity and they're far enough away where if they swing, they won't hit my nose. You know, we have all these things that we stick in the way. With purpose of heart, they would cleave to the Lord. They, he wanted them to stick so close to the Lord that they couldn't do anything else but witness. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. You know, you see an illustration here of why this particular group is going to end up being called Christians. That brings us now to the main point of the lesson tonight. They were first called Christians at Antioch. You see the things that were put together here, it's finally when, when the people who were already believers began to obey. When the people who were already believers began to see the blessing of God, the hand of God, when the churches that really had spiritual men in them began to have fellowship with other churches that had spiritual men in them, began to encourage and exhort one another much people was added to the Lord. They were called Christians. Now there are, as I said, many different words for call in the New Testament. This doesn't mean the called out ones, the elect, eclecto. This doesn't mean those who were hollered at. There's a word for calling that is like to shout. This is a different word. It's crematizo. Crematizo only occurs twice in the New Testament. It occurs here in this passage. It occurs in Romans 7, 3, which we'll look at in a moment. It means to be given a name based on your chief occupation. It's a word that was used in law to constitute a firm for business. Business. 
You know, now I've incorporated a lot of businesses, nonprofits and for profit corporations. And you know what? The people that I've done this legal work for are always trying to find a name that will identify their business. Now, somebody who's selling stocks and bonds is not going to name his business Al's Tire and Donut Shop. It just isn't. If he's going to sell stocks and bonds, it's going to have something to do with stocks and bonds. Or wealth management or something like that. If you're trying to establish a firm that is known for its serious intent, you're not going to name it Mary Had a Little Lamb. You name your firm based on the kind of business that it will be. They were first called Christians. It was like a legal term for being given a name based on the chief occupation that you do. In the English language, we have many names that are like that, and I suppose other languages do the same. I know a man by the name of Dr. Baker. You know what? I know what his ancestors did. Now, he happens to be a pastor today. But his name was given to his ancestors because of their chief occupation. I know a man named Mr. Cooper. Now, today, he's a very excellent construction man, owns a construction company. But you know, I know what his ancestors did. They were barrel makers, because a cooper was a barrel maker. You've known people by the name of Mr. Black, and you know what their ancestors did? Their ancestors were blacksmiths. We have multiple names, Mr. Carpenter. <laughs> you know, you can go through it. And most of the occupations that we see today, there were people who got that name because their ancestors did it. Now, here is a group of people at Antioch who became so zealous for Christ because of the teaching of a very zealous man who had persecuted the church and had caused the scattering, <laughs> making them obedient, who now trains them for a full year. And that group of believers became so excited about being Christians, about being witnesses to everybody they saw, about sharing the gospel with everyone, because they knew people were lost and headed for hell. They were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The man who wrote that is the man who taught them. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here we are with the Grecians. Being witnessed to by a man who had been a Jew of Jews. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Oh, people, they were first called, that is, given a name based upon their chief occupation of being Christians. Is that your chief occupation? If it's not, perhaps we understand why there's no impact in the secular workplace where we work. You say, but I might lose my job. You're right. Persecution might arise. You're right. You might be scattered abroad. And suddenly you will see, yes, there is a necessity to witness for Christ because the things of this world don't matter. They don't matter. Recently, as you know, we drove down to Florida to take our daughter to college to start her first year. And in the process, we discovered that our home there had been broken into and ransacked. 
all the drawers pulled out of all the dressers and desks and cab cabinets and dumped on the floor. All the financial papers of one of my son, he'd been storing them there. I, he later took them home because he saw what could happen. My kids have stored a lot of their stuff in that house. Um, all those things had been ransacked through, I suppose, people looking for money. Who ever leaves money, you know, unattended like that? But um, they'd ransacked it. We spent maybe 20 minutes in the house, you know, found a few things missing. But hey, got to move on with life. Went to my mother-in-law's house, found a homeless man living in it. Broken in. Broken into her garage, too. Had a, an automobile in that garage that was all pulled apart. <laughs> the things of earth, people. The things of earth. As the hymn writer says, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This church, it says, understood the grace of God. They gave God the glory. Did you see both those things are in this passage? When will we stop focusing on stuff and care about eternity? It makes no difference, those things. Really made no difference to me. I mean, I tried to solve the problem a little bit, you know, lock the door, for example, tell the fellow he had to leave. But if I spend all my time worrying about stuff, what impact will I have for eternity? If I spend all my energy worrying about money, what impact will I have for eternity? I hope you're asking yourself the question, too. Not just saying, yeah, Pastor, if you worry about those things, what kind of impact will there be? Okay, ask the question yourself. What impact will I have for eternity? What do you want to hear when you stand before Jesus? Will he say, yes, you deserve the name Christian because that was what you were primarily known for when you walked on earth. You got that name because it was your chief occupation. The other things, like how you earned your living, are sidelines. Your chief occupation was that you were a Christian. Folks, that's a powerful point that's being made by the text. It's not my opinion. That's the point that is being made by the text. This is the very first time. Now you look at the people in the chapters before. They were going on their way rejoicing like the Ethiopian eunuch. They were busy witnessing and showing revivals. I mean, that's what we see up in Samaria. Uh, we find people at Jerusalem that were excited and they were gathered together, breaking the uh, bread daily from house to house. And the very first place anybody's called a Christian is at Antioch. That tells you the depth of their commitment. Those other believers in the f previous chapters, they were definitely committed. But to what extent compared to the church in Antioch? It puts us to shame, doesn't it? The only other place that this word is found is in Romans chapter 7. I'll read verses 1 through 4 for you. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Law in general has dominion over you as long as you live. Now, you know, if, uh, if you're dead, you are not going to be hauled before a judge. Self-evident, yes? 
you know, you will not be given a speeding ticket if you have been speeding 100 miles an hour and at the end of that you crash into a brick wall and die. You know what? They're not going to give you a speeding ticket because you're dead. The law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Life and death, there's the separating thing for law in general. Now we have a specific law that he's going to deal with here. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. Remember, law has dominion while you're alive. Law does not have dominion when you're dead. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Now, it tells you what law we're talking about. We're not talking about Roman law, because Roman law, a person could divorce. We're not talking about Jewish law, because under Jewish law, a person could divorce. We're talking about what God calls the law of the husband. It's a divine law that God established. It's a divine law that joins a man and a woman together that is broken only by death, and that's why historically marriage vows have said, until death us do part. Because they understood that marriage, in the eyes of God, is a permanent bond broken only by death. He goes on. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. That's our word. Called. Given a name based upon her chief occupation. Given a name that identifies her business firm. Adulteress Incorporated. Public proclamation. Adulteress Incorporated. That is her chief occupation. God is very serious about the issue of divorce and remarriage while a former spouse is still alive. You can't cut this any other way. So then, if while her husband liveth she be married to another man, she shall be called, given a name based on her chief occupation, an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Scripture is clear that because death breaks the law, severs the law of husband and wife, a widow or a widower may remarry and in moral purity do so. But if a former spouse still lives, it is adultery to remarry after divorce. Very few people preach that anymore. That used to be the standard teaching of Bible-believing Christians, based on this and many other passages. And oh yes, I know all the arguments about the so-called exception clause in Matthew and all that. It doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about here. This is a very clear doctrinal statement. It applies to Jews and Gentiles. It applies across the board. It does not ap apply to a betrothal period. She should be called an adulteress. And he uses that as an illustration to drive home a spiritual truth. Now, if that illustration is not true, this spiritual truth is not true. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Even as a marriage is to bring forth fruit, that is, children, so we are to bring forth fruit unto God, because we are faithfully joined to Christ. And that is a bond which is not severed, the bond with the law, that is the law of Moses, he's talking here now. He's talked about three different types of law in this passage. 
is no longer our master. Just like if a wife dies or if a husband dies, there is no longer that relationship that binds them together. Even so, when we trusted in Christ, we were set free. Dear people, that's the word. It's a powerful word that's used over in Acts chapter 11. They were first called Christians. <clears throat> it is interesting to me that God only put it twice in the New Testament. And what a contrast being given a name based on your chief occupation as a Christian or being given a name based on your chief occupation of adultery. God gives us contrasts like that to show us that we are to be a separated, a set-apart people, a people who live holy lives, a people who live consecrated lives, a people whose lives are dedicated entirely, 100%, and our main focus in life is Jesus Christ and him crucified, and the things of eternity, so that the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We pray that as it has gone forth tonight, it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. Oh, Father, how we thank you for the believers at Antioch who set the example for us. Because as Saul, the Apostle Paul, began to teach them, the man who had killed so many of them, the man who had caused the persecution to arise, the man that God actually used to bring about the obedience of the church by causing the church to be scattered was the man who now taught them what it meant to live with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind for the glory of Christ. And it was thus at Antioch that they were first called Christians. Those whose chief occupation was being a follower of Christ. Father, help us that we might likewise deserve the name of Christian. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.